Hello and welcome. Casablanca co-screenwriter Julius Epstein shared the Best Screenplay Oscar for the 1942 film with his twin brother Philip, but years later Julius' assessment of the screenplay and the film itself was not quite what you'd expect to hear from a man who created such an iconic movie. Julius had a colourful background. He was a champion boxer while at Penn State University, and he and Philip moved from New York to Hollywood to get into the movie industry. He won his first Oscar nomination in 1938 for Four Daughters, starring Claude Rains and John Garfield. In the early 1940s, director Frank Capra recruited the Epstein twins for a month's work on his wartime informational series, Why We Fight, including the episode The Nazi Strike, and that no doubt inspired some of his thinking for Casablanca. He had a difficult relationship with Jack Warner, and in 1952, Warner gave the Epstein names to the House Un-American Activities Committee. They never testified before the committee, but on a committee questionnaire, when asked if they were ever members of a subversive organisation, they responded, yes, Warner Brothers. Julius continued writing and in 1983 scored an Oscar nomination for Reuben Reuben with British star Tom Conti and a young Kelly McGillis. When I spoke to him by phone at the time, we started talking about Reuben and another script that he was quite proud of for Pete and Tilly. And then, of course, about Casablanca. You consider it to be the most sophisticated and best screenplay that you've written? Well, I, I, I would think so. Why do you say that? Uh, a photo finish between Ruben Ruben and Pete and Tilly. Oh, right. Yes, of course. If you, if you remember Pete and Tilly, I just ran it the other day for the first time in about 12 years. And, uh... It held up for me, anyhow. I don't. That, that's great. Well, t tell me, um, just specifically, you you've written some some uh, scripts that I felt would have been uh, uh, pretty sophisticated. Why do you feel that Reuben Reuben is the most sophisticated one, the most adult one? I, I don't I don't know the the other sophisticated pictures that you know that you have in mind. The Pete Kelly was, of course, and there weren't too many of those. You remember most the bulk of my work in the days when we had um, very rigid censorship. You weren't really allowed to be sufficient. Um, I, 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 do you remember House Calls? Yes, I do. Walter Matter. Um, there was a scene with Matthew uh, and Brenda Jackson with a sort of a love scene with one foot had to be on the floor. According to the movie set, the old movies that no, no male and female, but they were meant to get a one foot had to be on the floor. Right. <laughs> and we, we built the whole sequence around that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, my, the bulk of my work was not very sophisticated. I, I see now which which context you mean it in. Well, well, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I think probably we're talking about two different types of sophistication. I mean, in in, in many ways, a film that, of course, um, people regard here as a classic, and there is, is Casablanca, and they feel that that is that is a sophisticated film in a sense. Well, the big difference, Casablanca, was really concocted. Um, um, there was no truth in it, by which I mean there. We didn't know anything that was going on in Europe at the time, or Africa. And we found out later that um, yeah, no Germans ever appeared in Casablanca in uniform. And there were no such things of, uh, that is a transit. Right. If we had known, it wouldn't have made any difference anyhow. <laughs> right. <laughs> we would have gone right ahead. Right. Can, can I talk to you a little bit about Casablanca? For sure. Um, the, the many quotable and requotable lines from the film, you know, of all the gin joints and all the towns in the world, of the three of you writing it, who was the one who came up with each one? Uh, 
Oh, you mean with, with my brother or myself? Yes. Uh, well, it's just a coincidence that um, about two weeks ago I was in Boston and I had I was interviewed by the uh, Harvard Medical School the psychiatric or the psychology department who oh, was doing a survey and a study on collaboration. And uh, I said my brother and I were unique in the sense that we were twins. And there was a sort of ESP between us. He could, <laughs> one would start a line, the other would finish it. Or both would come up the same line together. Just more to do with genetics than talent. Right. And um, I couldn't honestly tell you, especially after all these years, who said what. Sometimes you would half say it and the other would finish it. Right. But that's a very unusual situation. Well, it certainly is, all the way down the line. But what, what, about, uh, what about the truth about, uh, you know, there's all, all the arguments about... Uh, 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 the play it again line. What was the truth of that? Yeah, play it again? Yeah. Uh, you played it for her? As a matter of fact, you never said again. Right. You said play it. Uh, I can't tell you about that line because nobody ever thought that it would uh, become a um, sort of a trademark. Because uh, nobody thought the picture was to much more than the usual made as a program picture, one of the uh, one of sixty that Warner's made that year. Oh. It made sixty every year, so did every other major studio. And nobody thought we'd be doing anything terribly special. Especially with all the trouble with ending and uh, and shooting without a finished script. A great deal of chaos and argument and uh, just thought, well, we hoped it would be a pretty good picture, maybe a little better than most of the program, but nobody had any idea that uh, 1984 it would be played. And I have a retrospect, July 3rd, I think, at the UCLA, that's the university here. Right. And, uh, Casablanca is one of the nine pictures to be shown. Right. But, um... That's my favorite picture. I think that uh, Ruben Ruben is a much better picture. Really? Well, well I, I, I think you're probably right, in, in honesty. I mean, it's, it's just hard to to push a classic uh, to the side. And, uh, in those days, uh, due to many factors, the you know, biggest factor, of course, was censorship. Mm. Now you do, anyway, near the truth. Twins have a, a divorce that ended happily. You know, that most divorce is bringing great happiness to a lot of people. <laughs> and I had a picture, we had a picture ruined uh, by Foolish Ron. Because uh, our ending was that she had divorced and she came down there, and oh, they wouldn't allow that. So we had to give her a big speech at the end how miserable she was. <laughs> Either that, or they had to be killed by a truck or something. <laughs> yes. You had to be punished. Right. <laughs> Today in pictures, you're punished if you get married. <laughs> That's right. And stay married. Yes. <laughs> um, tell me... Yeah, the difference is that uh, Ruben Ruben, uh, 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 as is apparent to everybody with any sort of literacy that it's based on... Um, Brendan Thomas with a touch of Brendan Bean. Um, and it's made of truth to it. As a matter of fact, uh, the original started when um, Dylan Thomas was a house guest of Peter DeVries. Peter DeVries had to throw him out of the house. <laughs> so we'd rather soften that angle of it. Right. <laughs> what, what, with Reuben Reuben, um, did you write the script with Tom Conti in mind? No. No, no. There was nobody in mind. What happened was that uh, 
I guess it was about four years ago, maybe five years ago, Conti was playing in New York on the stage. Right. And whose life is it anyway? Right. And uh, Walter Shenson, the producer, and I were in New York, not on business, and not together, actually. We just quit it happened to be in New York together, and he went to see Conti. The Saturday matinee, and said, oh my God, he'd be right for the part. Um... Uh, Went backstage, talked to him. Sunday morning, Conti Court called and said, I'll do it. But it took us three years to get the money. Huh? Hey, I, I, under, I understand every every major studio turned it down. Oh, more than once. Which is a sign of a quality picture, because Sam's of Endearment was around for five years before they could get a production. <laughs> Big show for about three or four years. Oh, if you if you uh, write a script now, it's accepted immediately. You have to start worrying. <laughs> Something wrong there. Uh, um, and w you've obviously seen the film, uh, you know, probably several times over. Are you happy with Tom Cotty's performance? Oh, <laughs> I would think so. As a matter of fact, the um, the last day of shooting. The wrap-up day, the wrap-up party in North Carolina, we shot it in North Carolina. Uh, I bet Conti at dinner that he would be nominated for the Academy Award. I was so sure that, I, I wasn't positive he would be nominated because I had no idea what the competition would be. Right. But I felt that the performance would get a lot of recognition. Right. And, and has he bought you dinner yet? Carefully avoided. Uh, he's Scottish, you see. What about uh, what did you think of the young lass, Kelly McGillis? Well, it's another story. My son was a social producer on the picture. It, it sounds like a, a very bad press agent story. <laughs> and went up to her and said, you're Geneva. And he discovered that she was a drama student. You know the Juilliard? Yes, I do. At Juilliard. And we were determined to have her when she came in and read for us in New York. Uh, but she was a student and uh, Juilliard said, no, you can't have six weeks old, she won't get her degree, and her father, who's a surgeon in California, insisted that she get her degree. And she said, no, she couldn't do it because she had to stay at Juilliard. So we fixed up a schedule, whereupon she flew to North Carolina every weekend. And we shot with her on the weekend. And the last week, which was the week before Christmas, she had her Christmas vacation. So we had a weekend and one full week. <laughs> and now she's working for Peter Weir, you know. Is she is? Yes, Peter Weir is shooting a picture about the Amish, you know, the Amish sect in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. She's a leading lady. Oh, really? Harrison Ford. Oh, that's wonderful. So she's well launched. Oh, yeah. She's going to be a big star, I think. I think she has a, uh, she's filling the void left by Grace Kelly. Oh, that's... Gee, that's interesting, yes. She's got the same sort of uh, well-bred quality. Yes, very strong, very strong on the screen. Yes. Tell me, over the years, have you have you specifically written for actors? Um, not lately, but uh, when, I, when I was on the contract, or my brother and I were together on the contract at Warner Brothers, uh, we were for about 14 straight years. Uh, at times we did because they had they had their actors on the contract, three Bogarts every year. So occasionally you would write knowing who your cash was going to be because they were on the contract. Right. But when the contract system died, which was uh, right after World War II, and everybody started to freelance, you had really had no idea what you were writing. Right. Well, can I ask you this? 
in two parts. Firstly, when you were writing for people in, under the contract system, who did you feel handled your lines, got the most out of the lines that you gave them? Well, <laughs> as a writer, I thought the person who read the lines as written, <laughs> they gave the most. I would say Cagney. Right. Cagney and Bogart. But I only did one Bogart picture, and I think it's a three Cagney. Right. And, um, I'm thinking for Betty Davis. Betty Davis was uh, always a struggle. Why was she always a struggle? Well, we were also the right after Casablanca. We were made producers for a while, and the next picture was Mr. Skeppington. And uh, as a usual, very busy schedule. They shot for 110 days. And Jack Warner said to the members, "Saying, why are you so far behind schedule?" And we sent her back a memo saying, because Betty Davis is a slow director. <laughs> she took over. <laughs> she I don't know, she was so good. Yeah. But, uh, I, I, I would name Cagney and Bogart. Right. And what about, what about since the, the studio days? Who, which actors um, have you enjoyed most in the, in the way they've handled your lines? Walter Matthau. Right. <laughs> I thought you'd say that. <laughs> I really believe it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's forced by seeing the big show the other day. Yeah. Yeah, he's a wonderful actor. He's uh, he's one of my top ten favorite actors of all time. Marvelous. Uh, can I ask you, you're, you're obviously um, a very active gentleman. You're, what, 75 now? Uh, in August. In August. What, 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 do you attribute to um, to being so active and, and being able to participate so much still in the film industry? Well, I tell you, uh, I was asked that question last week. There was a um, what's called a writers' workshop on by the guild, and I was the writer of sort of it shows clips and pictures. I was sort of lecturing. I was asked that question for the law. My answer was. Uh, Jogging in an apple a day. <laughs> you really jog every day? Well, I, I, I've stopped jogging now because I have a bad back, but I'm walking. Right. I'm walking as fast as I can. Right. About five, six times a week. Good. Do, do you smoke or drink? No, I don't smoke. Yes, I drink. Uh, moderately. Right. Two drinks is my limit. Right. What, what do you like? Vodka martini. Right. <laughs> And what about more more work? Are you are you working on a screenplay at the moment? No, I'm, I, I I just laid down a script. I've been sent the script we're negotiating on, and uh, I don't know if I'll do it or not. I'm not quite sure I'm right for it. And um, these days, every picture is so important. You want to make sure you're doing the right thing. Right. Uh, I Stanley Kubrick has a picture every six years. Yes, he's certainly careful. You know, I haven't had so many six years with him. No. <laughs> By simple mathematics. Right, right. But but you obviously, I mean, are you working on any original screenplay at the moment yourself? No, I have an original screenplay that I did quite some time ago, which I've revised, which I've, uh, the producers are now uh, shopping around. And it's very encouraging because it's been turned down. So I uh, hope it's not the same way as uh, yeah. Ruben. Well, it seems to be on the right track, doesn't it? Yeah. Very encouraging when you're done. You know you have something. Do, do you, over the years with your writing, have you, um, have you been so disciplined that you always write on a particular, at a particular time each day for so many hours, or do you just write when you feel like it? Well, when I work, I'm not uh, one of those writers who has to write something every day. Uh, I work two hours, a, when, I, when, I, when I'm when working, uh, I work two hours a day, usually from 12 to 2, because I'm not much of a lunch eater. I figure everybody's wasting their time having lunch, and I'm getting my work done. Right. I feel very noble about that. <laughs> and um, w one last question. I, I know it's hard. 
you've poured out millions of words, uh, obviously, over the years, but is there any one line at all that sticks in your mind that you think, you know, was really a gem that, that was a, a stroke of genius? Well, uh, it would be hard. One that comes to mind was one that I put in on the set. It's not a very good picture. Every Wednesday. Right. Uh, I was also the producer on that picture. Uh, it required the actress to have a long walk up the flight of stairs. Rector felt she couldn't take it in silence. The line. Sorry, I, I missed a little bit of that. Who was the actress? Rosemary Mayberry. Oh, right. Uh, she's on the stage, actually. And she had just had an argument with her gardener. If you see. She came in and was walking up a long flight of stairs. And she came to the man and said, No woman has had any luck with the gardener since Lady Chatley. <laughs> That was called in the newspaper. Yes. <laughs> the line that's most quoted, I guess, is um, round up the usual suspect. That's right, yes. <laughs> Do you like that one? Well, it gave us an ending. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. I'm very grateful for that. I must say that I, uh, well, I had you on the phone that, uh, Australia is becoming a real fact in movie making, isn't it? Oh, yes. There's some marvelous movies coming out of Australia. Have you seen any of them? Oh, yes. Uh, a brilliant career. What do you think of the standard of writing in them? The writing? In, yes, in the Australian films. Uh, those I've seen are very good. You can't have a good picture without good writing. I don't think. Any criticisms? Uh, other ones I've seen, I'm sure there are Australian pictures that we haven't seen that can have good stance of criticizing, but I haven't seen them. Right. Like, like the farm pictures that come here, the French pictures, the Spanish pictures. We only see the best. Right, of course. And they're awfully good, the Spanish, French, they're awfully good, the ones we see. Or the Australian pictures. Oh, I'm, I'm, I must pass that on to... Approximately the same language. Yes, approximately being the qualifying word. Well, it's, it's closer. To, uh, Australia is closer to America than, than the British are. Oh, very much so. I think the British pictures. I would like to see some captions <laughs> <laughs> to make out what they're saying. Yes. Well, Mr. Epstein, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. And if I get to Australia, I'll safely call you. Please, and and keep writing. I'll try. And look after yourself. Thank you very much. Some shrewd and honest observations there. Julius Epstein continued to write into his later years, including for the short-lived Casablanca TV series starring David Soule. He also co-wrote for a series of documentaries called History Rediscovered. Julius passed away in December 2000 in Los Angeles. He was 91.